My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am President and CEO of the Center for Training and Career, CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. Now we have our own facility, and so it enables us to expand programs in response to the needs of the community. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. Good evening. Welcome to Native Voice TV. My name is Sundas Martinez. And I'm Siwafili Rose Amador. And together we are Native Voice TV. We are the Indigenous people. Yes, we are. Well, I'd like to introduce today Barbara Attard. And Barbara is the Independent Police Auditor. Now, what does the Independent <laughs> Police Auditor do? I know that sometimes people get confused and they hear police and they think you're the police department. You're not the police department, are you? No, we're not. We're, as the, the title would infer, we're an independent aud office. And, and it also is confusing because people hear auditor and they think that we audit books and things like that. Like but a bean counter or something. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> but what we do is we audit investigations of police misconduct complaints. The, the office was set up uh, about 12 years ago now. And uh, it has uh, four different functions. One is to be a place where people can file a complaint against a police officer, a San Jose police officer specifically. Mm -hmm. And then we audit the internal affairs complaints, the investigations, we can sit in on the interviews. We have the authority to make policy recommendations, which I think is one of the most important things that we do. Uh, because in that way you can, if you see a problem, you can re recommend a change mm -hmm. and that will have a lasting effect. Um, we also recently have the authority now to, um, to review all officer-involved shootings and death in custody cases. And then our, one of the most important functions that we do, and it's also mandated, is to do community outreach to mm -hmm. inform, the people, inform the community what our services are. So do you have like seminars or, or just like classes or, or any kind of informational, I guess, classes to, how would to give to the, know yeah, How would about someone you? know about you? Okay. Well, we are always available to go out and speak to community groups. Mm -hmm. um, we go to a lot of neighborhood association meetings. We do a lot of outreach to youth as well. I brought a copy of our student guide. Um, we, we like to go to different high school, um, high school, even junior high school functions. We also speak with parent groups, but the student guide, we're just um, in the process of revising it and, and updating it, but it informs youth about what their rights are if they have an encounter with police officers and also what their responsibilities are in those encounters at well, as well. Yeah. We want to encourage youth to kind of know their rights, but in, in a situation, not to, uh, not to uh, not comply with the officer. We want to teach them to comply, and then if there is an issue, to file a complaint later. Yeah. And these uh, youth guides are translated into Spanish. This is a Spanish and English uh, translation, and then we have also English and Vietnamese uh, student yeah. guides as well. What are the typical complaints that you get as far as um, with r different races and different cultures? What type of complaints are, are most consistent 
that come into your office? You know, we get actually the, the whole gamut of complaints. Uh -huh. We get um, the basic, the officer was rude or discourteous to me to, you know, there was a shooting and, and my relatives should not have been shot. And then everything in between from officers not carrying out their duties, like, you know, someone called the police and mm. the police didn't respond adequately to um, improper arrests and improper improper stops. Yeah. Um, you know, some of, you know, you, you mentioned different races, different cultures. Sometimes people feel that they were stopped based on, on their race or, some, oh. or those profiling. kinds of issues, profiling. exactly. Is there a lot of that going on in Santa Clara County or other police, you know, police uh, state or police and in, in this whole area? Well, you, you're asking if that's a particular problem yeah. here. Do you get complaints you know, about profiling? We do. Very we often? do get some complaints mm -hmm. about it. I, it's not the most complaints. I think the most complaint is is basic courtesy issues, mm -hmm. and then second would be force issues. But we do get, uh, you know. A significant proportion of, yeah. of those kinds of, of improper stop. We kind thought of it was important to have you here because you know a lot of the community has a misunderstanding that this is the police department. Why should I call the police department to complain about them? You know, and I think that's where the independent comes in, so they know it is separate from the police department, and you are reviewing the complaints against police officers. But is there a department within the police department that they also take complaints? Yes, there is. I there's, thought there was. There so is. There's, there's internal affairs. There. Okay. So, you know, and I should explain a little bit more about the process. We can take the complaint and then the way, the way that the system is set up, um, we refer that case to internal affairs. Internal Affairs does the investigation whether a complaint is filed in our office or in the Internal Affairs office. But the difference is, and I think why, why it's important to also register with the IPA, if, if the case is registered with the IPA, we actually have the authority to, um, to audit the full complaint no matter what it is, whereas if a case is filed with Internal Affairs, we don't have the full authority in, in some of the cases to audit them. We also have the authority to sit in on any of the interviews that we feel it's important to sit in on. And, and we regularly sit in on, on interviews of officers in uh, unnecessary force kinds of cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware you have the Community Advisory Council. Sundas currently sits on yes. it. I used to sit on it. And I know through the community there's a lot of recommendations that come that the police auditor makes to the council, but they're generated from community concerns. And I know one of them was that the um, th that your position be on the s on the scene when you know there's something a shooting occurs or a, a killing um, happens that um, you be present at that time and that was a recommendation that came from the community advisory council because they felt that in order for your office to make a proper uh, assessment of the situation you should be there from the beginning has that changed I mean yeah. now you're yeah, able that to be there. Yes, we are. Yeah, you're speaking about um, the IPAC, as, as we call it, mm -hmm. the IPA Advisory Committee. Right. And um, it's a very, very important group of people to mm -hmm. us. They are kind of our eyes and ears in the community. Mm -hmm. um, it's about a 25-person advisory board. And they come up, they do, you're right, they come up with great recommendations mm -hmm. for policy recommendations. And as a, at the end of last year, um, an agreement was made that whenever there's an officer-involved shooting or death in custody case, uh, my office, or particularly I, would be called and called to mm -hmm. the scene so that we could see, you know, what the what the circumstances are at, at the time of mm -hmm. the shooting. We could see what what the you know what the lighting is, where there might be witnesses, and we get um, advised of what the circumstances are of the shooting or the death in custody. I see. Wow, so you're right, right. You're right on the scene, wow. Exactly. So you get to see all the gore and all that. Well, before you would just read the reports, right, exactly. and have to exactly, make your... Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I particularly am a visual person, so mm -hmm. it helps me if I sure. go out to the scene to have a better sense, sense yeah. of what happened. Um, and we do, we actually stay behind that inside police line so mm -hmm. that we wouldn't uh, In interfere, with, interfere with any of the evidence. 
Yeah, but we do, yeah. we are close enough so that we can get a sense of what happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sometimes things just don't translate correctly when it's on paper as, as opposed to looking at it visually. You know, right. That's the best thing. And you, and you know, and especially with witness testimony, yeah. you know, you can get a sense of where that witness was, what they may actually have been able to see yeah. and what they may not have and, and get ideas as to where the police might look for additional witnesses. So let me ask you this. Um, Say you do an assessment, you review someone's uh, complaint, and you find that the police officer, you think he was in error, that it w he did misuse his power or whatever, or excessive mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. and yeah. What happens then? Well, um, it, you know, it depends on, on what the finding from internal mm -hmm. affairs was. Internal affairs may agree that it was improper conduct, mm -hmm. and in that case, we would both agree, and, and we would close, we would audit the case and close it as recommended. If internal affairs finds that the case was not sustained or proper or exonerated, one of those other findings, then we would write that up. We would write what we feel, you know, what we feel the evidence is mm -hmm that would uh, show a different finding, and we send that to internal affairs. Um, then internal affairs can either say, oh yeah, you're right, you know, we, we were uh, looking at it a different way, and they might change the finding. Another thing that might happen is that they would say, you know, I'm sorry, we think that we came up with the right finding, we disagree with you. Mm -hmm. We then have the authority to take it to the chief, and if the chief, the chief may decide to agree with the IPA or with internal affairs. If the, the chief disagrees with our recommendations, then we have the authority to take it to the city manager. The city manager oversees the police department. Mm -hmm. And if the, the city manager agrees with us, then, then the case would be, the findings would be changed. If the city manager also disagrees, then our authority is to write it up in our annual report. We do an annual report to the city council. I'm a city council appointee, mm -hmm. so our recommendations go to the city council. And in this report, we would write we write up cases where, where we end up in disagreement with the police department. We tell the circumstances of the complaint and you know why we think it should have been sustained, and 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 so that's the final step in that process. And this is a public document. It is. Yeah. Okay. It's. Um, we, we publish it this way. We also do some CDs of it, and we also post it on our website. Okay. Oh, wonderful. So somebody could go to your website, which is, where do they go for that? <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's the Basic City, City of San Jose website. So it's www.ci.sanjoseca.gov. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then you'd go to, you could do forward slash IPA forward slash. And they, um, would, they could download a copy of this, exactly. or they could probably go to your office and get a copy as well. Certainly. It's, it's Great. Right. So. Yeah, it's some really good information. Now, the big issue I've been reading about in the newspaper, tasers. You know, there's so many people, I mean, not so many, but there's a lot of people <laughs> still being killed with tasers. And, you know, I think the verdict's still out as far as how safe they are. You were making some recommendations um, on the use of tasers. Can you tell us about that? Certainly. We, um, we actually are required to report to the council two times a year. So this is our annual report. And we also had a mid-year report that actually just recently went to council because we were making two policy recommendations and, and we had some disagreement with the ch police chief over those recommendations. So we put it off to try to come to a consensus about mm -hmm. the recommendations. And one of the, t one of the recommendations is regarding tasers. Uh, the city of San Jose has tasers deployed to 820 patrol officers. And they're, at the time, while they do a four-hour training course that every officer who uses tasers is required to go through, there was no set policy for tasers outside of the general use of force policy, which is that you can only use the amount of force necessary to make an arrest or to overcome resistance. And we felt that, that it was much, very important, especially because with tasers, as you mentioned, there has been this unexpected outcome that um, where tasers, ha where people have died after tasers have been used or, or were seriously injured. And you know, I think there have been about 145 cases across Didn't the United States. Someone just died States. that same week, I think, that you made the recommendations in San Jose. Yeah, yeah, that was very sad. It mm -hmm. was. Um, 
just about a week before our recommendations went to the city council, there was a man and the officers used taser, a taser on him. Um, you know, I don't know all of the exact details because there's still an investigation going on. We don't know that taser was, was at all, you know, part of, of why he died. But yeah, after, shortly after the mm -hmm. taser was used on him, he did pass away. So we had made, we made recommendations that um, the policy, there had been a policy, kind of a general policy as to when officers should use tasers, you know, to overcome violent resistors, um, that kind of general when they should use, mm -hmm. use the taser. And then also a general kind of when tasers shouldn't be used, such as on incapacitated people or, or unconscious people, which, which mm -hmm. may seem, um, like something you don't necessarily have to put in writing, but that, yeah. but that was a policy. And we think that those basic, uh, you know, kind of general guidelines should be reinstated. And then we also recommended that several other policies, like if the officers are gonna be using tasers, whenever possible, they should warn both the, the suspect and other officers that the taser is gonna be used, uh, that except in, uh, lethal force situations that tasers not be used on pregnant women, elderly people, and young children. Um, and um, uh, there were there were three or four of those types mm -hmm. of, of basic recommendations that uh, tasers should only be the the five second jolt that that they were originally programmed for, mm -hmm. and that tasers not be used more than two times on a suspect. Um, and the chief, chief felt that those kinds of things should be dealt with in training and was a disagreeing that, that a hard policy be placed in, in their duty manual. And um, although on the day of the council meeting, the chief did come out with um, a four-page taser guideline that did incorporate many of the, uh, many of the uh, guidelines that we were recommending and, and some others Mm -hmm. um, as well. And this is also public knowledge as well, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Wait, these are guidelines and not policy. Exactly, exactly. So, so what happened at the council meeting, uh, there was some discussion of, of where these guidelines should be, if they should be in training or in policy. And the council basically said that the chief and I should discuss it further and come back to the council in January with, um, with the recommendation. Well, it, you know, it's a serious issue because it does impact people's lives, you know, life or death. Yeah. You know, exactly. So, I, you know, I think it's, it, it should I be looked at. I think tasers are just, I think, guidelined as a less, lesser lethal unit than a gun, right? So it's still lethal, so it, it, it can been, kill, yeah. yeah, and it has killed. But the, the guideline should be a policy, I, I believe it should be a policy, to uh, govern, or govern the way these things are used on people. I, I, I agree, yeah, <laughs> because otherwise it's just yeah. an arbitrary, uh, yeah. you know, somebody decides to use it or not. Or, yeah, yeah. and I have policy. to say, I think it's a very important weapon, and I think there are circumstances where the taser is certainly the best option, mm -hmm. the best forced option. But I do think it should be governed by a policy. And, yeah. you know, I, we, it's not, that we've received a lot of complaints or we don't see rogue officers out there inappropriately mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. them. But I think that it's important in light of, in light of the unforeseen circumstances mm -hmm. with tasers that the city have a policy in place for their use. That's true. Hmm. Now you were talking about officer courtesy and this is something you might want to comment on. You were talking about the kids and them yes. not giving badge numbers when requested and yes. they'll say, you know, I've, I've talked to uh, plenty of youths uh, in high school, including my son, and who had some particular things going on. And one of the things that uh, his friend was a little bit pudgy, right, so they wanted to go jogging at night. So the, the police officers pulled, over, pulled him over and said, uh, what'd you guys steal? So I always tell my son, you know, if anyone comes to you, know, any of the police officers ask you anything or whatever, be nice and ask for their badge number. And he says, I you know, did that, but they said no. And they would cover it up and, and they wouldn't give it to them and just drive off. But you know, that is part of the courtesy thing because it, it, it just makes things go even worse. If you have someone who's kind of volatile and you act that way, they're gonna act 
you know, they're going to act back or something like that, you know, with this type A personality, you know, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that are, are going to, you know, come back with some kind of uh, comment to the police officer and then they're going to have a problem, you know, with them having a problem, you know, fighting or whatever or using a taser or something like that. But it just escalates so many things, you know, going on. And just their views of police officers when they're told by parents, oh, you know, this is what you do and then it doesn't work, you know. It, right. It's too, yeah, you're talking mm -hmm. about basic disrespect. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think especially with youth, it's very mm -hmm. important that there be mutual respect. Yeah. And if, and I think in sometimes in circumstances like that where someone feels disrespected, mm -hmm. then they have to show that, that you know, they're a man and, yeah. and, and then it could easily escalate. So I agree with you. And, I mean, I take discourtesy complaints very seriously mm -hmm. because I think that Often, if if officers, if if officers, it's it's like any other any other employee, any other person you're dealing with, if they misbehave in that circumstance, then it can get more serious. And mm -hmm. I think so. I think it's very important that even discourtesy cases are looked at seriously. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how would someone file a complaint? Why don't you walk us through the steps? Okay. There. Yeah. There are several ways. They, our complaint form can be downloaded off of our website. And, um, and we can s mention that again later in the program, um, and maybe we can even put it in, in writing on, on the I think uh, we have on it television. on our, That's our great, okay. Um, so they, they can download the complaint, and then they can either mail the complaint in or bring it into the office. Uh, someone in our office will interview them, and, and we have a, a shared database with internal affairs, mm -hmm. so as soon as as soon as the complaint comes to us, we enter it into the database and, and uh, then Internal Affairs is, is aware of the complaint. Uh, we can also take the complaint over the telephone okay. and then we would send the forms to them. If someone has injuries, we think it's very important that they come in so that we could take photos of the injuries. Um, and then there's some paperwork that we have to fill out as well. So, but we can take them over the phone. We can refer them to Internal Affairs if they prefer only to make a statement once, because often if, if we take the complaint, there would be a follow-up uh, interview with Internal Affairs. Yeah. But um, we, we want to make the process as available to people as it can be. We have uh, people in our office who speak Spanish, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a Vietnamese speaker as well. And if people speak another language, we can uh, accommodate that through translators. Um, we also you know, want to encourage somebody, if they have a criminal case pending, that they speak with their attorney before filing uh, so their attorney is aware that they, mm -hmm. they're going to file a complaint. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the, the complaint comes into our office. We refer it to, to internal affairs. We then audit it. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we sit in on interviews. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Now yeah. you mentioned the uh, guidebook for youth. Now you're updating it, or, you, or do you have those available now? We are in the process the of updating okay. it, although it is on our website and can okay. be downloaded off the website in mm -hmm. its current form. But there, um, there are in it there are uh, some referrals with phone numbers that that aren't accurate anymore. So okay. so I want to uh, alert people to that. Now tell us where you're located. We are at 2 North 2nd Street on the lower level, the, the courtyard level, Suite 93. Okay. So, so we're not, right at 2nd. You're second. not co-located co with the police department. No, we're and separate. And you're not with City Hall. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. We're independent. independent. We have our own space. Excellent. Right at 2nd and Santa Clara. It's very <laughs> easily accessible from mm -hmm. a lot of public transportation. Yeah. We also have a... Uh, a brochure that's available. This mm -hmm. brochure is translated into uh, Spanish and Vietnamese as well. So Great. the information is, is available. So they could just go to the office and pick those up right yes, up at the front yes, desk? Yes, yes. Okay. And um, you know, we are available to do presentations. Yeah. You know, what's, what's also point. good is if there's anyone out there who are having some kind of community events, you know, they can invite the auditor and their people out there and they actually have a booth and uh, present all this information to the community. We definitely have the yeah. literature out there, so yeah. the community's aware of it. Exactly. We're yeah. happy to, to talk to people anytime, any yeah. place. So. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank Let's you. see what's going on in the community okay. and uh, catch up here.
Okay, listen to Indian Time Radio, KKUP 91.5 FM, every Tuesday from 8 to 10 p.m. with Jack and David, uh, David Romero, Romero <laughs> our very own. Yes, the American Indian Alliance meets the first Wednesday of every month. It's a potluck dinner meeting at 6.30 at St. Philip's Church, and their calendars are now available. They had them at their Christmas dinner. They'll have them at the New Year's Eve powwow, and you can get them from Renita or Laverne. Their numbers are on the screen. Okay, great. They're great calendars. Uh, Native Tana Program, Washoe Tribe. That's uh, going to be at 480 North 1st Street, that's, San Jose. That address, I believe, is correct. It might be 490, but it'll be close. We'll update that <laughs> as soon as they move in and open the doors. <laughs> and CTC Center for Training and Careers has career and personal development workshops. Call us at 251-3165. Lots of classes. All right. And Assemblyman Simone Salinas. He's Assemb going to be the he's, guest. Oh, he's honor. going to be our guest for our next show, so That's stay right. tuned for our next show. And here is the address for the independent police auditor. This is, uh, as I put this picture up because I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's you. <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> hey, that's not Barbara. No, the advisory council. City but actually, Sound I got Bay. this off the, um, the website because it was on there. <laughs> yeah. And because I was on there too, so I thought I'd throw <laughs> it in there. But that's the address. And if you want to be a sponsor of Native Voice TV, contact us at 251-3165 or at nativevoicetv at aol.com. We're on every Sunday at 6, 6 o'clock. And we do need sponsors. Appreciate yes, the sponsors we have. The Washer Tribe is now a sponsor, Native Voice TV. They'll be opening their offices sometime in January. They have, um, I think they have their furniture and everything in yeah. place. It's a really good TANF program that they're going to be introducing to this um, Santa Clara County community. And they did hire Kwasi Wat. Yeah, so our, our Kwasi Wat of, is yes, there. Yes, of Native Voice TV to work yeah. there. And also, a lot of you know Kelly Gamboa from yeah. the American Indian Education Center. She will be working with the TANF program as well. Yeah. So we have some friends there. and. Very, very nice Some people friends everywhere. Yeah, that are working <laughs> there. We're looking forward to them coming to town. So yeah. a lot of good things. And so we thank you again, Barbara, for coming. We'll definitely send people your way. We'll make sure they're, they're aware yeah. of your services because, you know, I just don't think we've gotten the word out enough. We want to keep it out there. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that, you know, that's one thing that, that we're... We know is that there's always room for more outreach yeah. and we want people to know Definitely. that we're there. Give us your number one more time. Our number is 408-794-6226. Remember, if you have a complaint, call Barb. <laughs> well, not about anything, <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a, a complaint about the yeah. police department, call Barb's office. And we want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Sunday at 6 o'clock. 6 p.m. Good night.